Hi, I'm Taryn. And I'm Stella. And this is Meeple University, how to play Robin Hood and the Merry Men. In Robin Hood and the Merry Men, players take on the roles of the well-known characters from the Robin Hood legend during the Regency of Prince John. The game is played semi-cooperatively, with players working together to foil the villain's plans while also competing against each other to earn the most victory points for their efforts. So in that case, player will need to balance their act, whether they need to act something that benefit the greater good or reach something that benefit them personally, because everyone will lose the game if Prince John reaches goal before the end of the game. We'll be teaching today from the deluxe edition of the game, so there are a few components in here which are upgraded from the base retail version. And now, let's learn how to play Robin Hood and the Merry Men. There is quite a lot going on in this game, and so we're going to start this video with a relatively extensive overview of the game flow and its aims before getting into the details of the mechanics. We'll be focusing on the semi-cooperative mode throughout this video, and we'll be returning at the end of the video to cover the fully cooperative and solo modes that are also available. I'm also not going to step you through the setup of the game, and I'll leave you to follow the rulebook on that, but I will point out the starting conditions for most of the components as they come up through the explanation. In semi-cooperative mode, Robin Hood is a game for two to five players. Players are competing against each other to earn the most victory points and working together to prevent Prince John from meeting his aims and ruining the village. There are two losing conditions that players need to avoid. Firstly, at the start of the game, each of these four roads has a stack of pennies numbering two more than twice the number of players in the game. Through the game, the royal carriages will carry these pennies into the castle and if any one of these four stacks ever runs out of pennies, the game ends immediately and all players lose. So players will need to erect barricades and rob these carriages in order to prevent this from happening. Secondly, players need to keep the Sheriff's Guard out of the village. At the start of the game, there will be 12 guards distributed evenly in the sites around the castle. And then through the game, guards will be added to these sites. If a guard ever needs to be added to a site and there's no space, it goes down onto the village guard track. And if the guard track is ever completely filled with six guards, the game ends immediately and all players lose. So players will need to capture or fight these guards to get them off the board and prevent this from happening. As long as players can prevent these two outcomes over the length of the game, which is five rounds or only four in a five player game, then the player with the most victory points will win the game. Each of the five rounds is broken into two phases, the Merry Men phase and the Hero phase, and players will have access to different actions in each. Thematically, the Merry Men phase sees players set their followers off in order to do the grunt work, so that's gathering resources, building barricades, and building traps. While the Hero phase sees the player's heroes leaping off into the battle and performing the glamorous actions, such as robbing carriages, fighting against the guards, and winning archery tournaments. However, it's important to keep in mind that the Merry Men and Hero phases are as important as each other, as players should be earning their victory points roughly evenly in both. At the start of the Merry Men phase, each player will have four Merry Men cards and three active Merry Men meeples. Any meeples in this space are not active in this round. On his or her turn, a player plays one card, and then depending on the card played, plays a meeple into one of the locations on the board, immediately performing the action of that location. Play then passes to the second player, who plays a card and places a meeple, and then so on around the table until all players have placed all of their active meeples. Then follows the hero phase. Firstly, all players draft additional weapon dice so that each player has at least two for the hero phase, because these dice are required for many hero actions. Then, the first player takes his or her entire hero turn. Firstly, he or she reveals a villain card and then resolves it, moving the villains around, adding more guards to the board, 
and advancing carriages towards the royal castle. Then, the player takes two actions in a row with his or her hero meeple, moving it to a location, taking the action there, and then moving it to a second location and taking the action there. Play then passes to the second player, who draws and resolves another villain card and then takes two actions with his or her hero meeple, and then so on around the table once until each player has resolved this sequence of events once. There is then a cleanup phase before play proceeds to the next Merry Men phase. This game has a variety of ways to earn victory points, some during the game but mostly at the end of the game. I'll cover all of these in more detail as we go through the rules of the game, but I'll summarise the three main areas where you'll be gaining your victory points so that you can appreciate the goals that we're building towards. The majority of your points will come from three main actions, building traps, building barricades, and sending envoys to the Crusades. These actions will cost you resources and are carried out during the Merry Men phase but the value of each of these actions in victory points is influenced by your actions during the hero phase, as your hero will take actions which increases your reputation, and the further up the reputation track you go, the more points you will gain for these three actions. Points can be earned by freeing prisoners from the prison. During the game, your merry men will be arrested by the guards, and can be broken out by the actions of your heroes. Jailbreaking opponents' merry men will earn you points directly, and while jailbreaking your own merry men isn't worth points, it will still help you avoid losing points at the end of the game for having imprisoned merry men. Finally, players earn points by managing their merry men cards. Recall that you must play a card every time you make a merry man placement. When doing this, you have the option to discard the card in order to take a stronger action, or Play the card into this personal pile in order to take a weaker action. Players in the personal pile then score points at the end of the game, and in particular will score bonus points for having sets of matching cards. Ultimately, players need to work out how to balance these point scoring objectives with keeping the villains at bay. If the players haven't collectively lost the game before it ends after 4 or 5 rounds, then the player with the highest score wins. First, we'll take you through the Merry Men phase of each round, and this is where you'll be placing your Merry Men meeples out onto action spaces on the board in order to take actions. There are a lot of action spaces on the board, but only 8 of them are available to Merry Men, and these are the ones which show the Merry Men flag icon in the little box next to the action space. Of those 8 action spaces, 6 of them are located in the main illustrated part of the board. These are the places where players will send their merry men in order to get the basic resources in the game. Each of these locations is split into a large circular main area and four hideouts around the side, and I'll go through the difference between these later. The other two merry men action spaces are shown up in the top left hand corner of the board. This is where players will build barricades and traps and send envoys to the Crusades. And this is where the main victory points paying actions will take place. So if you remember that distinction, you'll be getting your resources out here on the main board and scoring your victory points over here in the top corner. To keep the board language independent, each of these locations is identified by an icon. And you'll see these icons on some of the cards and other features in the game, so get used to reading them. Each player has six Merry Men meeples at the start of the game, but in each round only three are available for use. These other ones are simply brought in to replace any which are arrested during the game. The players can also unlock a fourth spot, which would allow four actions in a single round, later on in the game. Each player will also have a closed hand of four Merry Men cards and may have some face-up cards in his or her passive pile from cards that were played there in previous rounds. 
and you'll remember that mechanism from the opening part of the video. In order to take a turn during the Merry Men phase, the player has two basic options, to play actively or to play passively. In order to play passively, the player takes any card from his or her hand, does not matter what that card looks like, and plays it into his or her passive pile. The passive pile may have no more than six cards in it at any given time, and if a player goes above six, he or she then discards down to six. After doing this, the player may place a meeple into the main area of any one of the six resource gathering sites in the main illustrated area of the board. The player then gains the bonus which is printed in that location. In this case, one weapons die. Players can use a main area even if other players' meeples are already in there, or may use the same location twice in the same round. Passive plays are restricted to the six main gathering sites. Players cannot use a passive play to construct or send an envoy to the Crusades. At these main six locations, players will gain one weapons die, one iron, one wood, one distraction token, or one tools. At the sixth location in the town square, players will have the opportunity to pickpocket the rich to gain some money and other resources, and I'll talk about how that works a little bit later. The player's second option is to play actively. And in order to play actively, the player takes a card either from his or her hand or from the passive pile and then plays it into the active pile. This will be discarded at the end of the round and so it won't contribute to any points that are gained over in this passive pile. The player then chooses one of that Merry Man card's active abilities, places a meeple into the corresponding location based on this icon, and takes the action printed on the card, not the action printed on the board. When placing a Merry Man into one of the six gathering sites on the main part of the board, the player does not place the Merry Man in the main area, but instead in the topmost unoccupied hideout space. That is a space not containing a guard or another player's Merry Man. Note that the hideout may contain a trap either belonging to that player or another player. If this ever is confusing, you can use these icons here to remember that playing to this side of the board lets you play in the big circular main area, and this side of the board lets you play in the four little hideouts. The player then gains the benefit printed on the card instead of what's on the board, and across the five main gathering sites this means getting two resources instead of one. Playing an active card is also the only way that you can send a meeple to the construction yard, or to the Crusades. Next, we'll talk about how the other three action spaces resolve. That is, robbing in the town square, constructing traps and barricades, and sending an envoy to the Crusades. If you take a passive action to try to rob the rich in the town square, you will perform some skill checks using the black skill dice in order to determine your success. This iconography is used throughout the game, and when you count a number of arrows by themselves, this represents a number of dice that you roll. When you count a number of arrows sticking out of a bullseye, that's the number of successes that you need to roll for a successful skill check. So, to attempt to rob the rich the first time, roll three skill dice and attempt to get one success. If you are successful, you could stop there and draw one random tile from the loot bag, immediately claiming the benefit. This is the only place Merry Men can gain coins, and a lot of the loot is coins, but there are some other resources that you can gather through collecting this loot. Instead of taking the loot, you can push your luck and try to rob somebody else. The second attempt you try for robbing will take two dice for one success. So roll the dice and see whether you're successful. If you are, then you can draw two loot from the bag instead of one. Or you can take a third attempt rolling a single die and trying to get a success. If at any point before you stop rolling you have an unsuccessful roll, your Merry Man is captured and arrested. Move that Merry Man to the first level of the prison and pay a fine, 
which can be a coin or any one of your resources or distraction tokens, and which is paid into the sheriff's stash down here in the tree. If you have no possessions to pay as a fine, then you move straight to level two of the prison instead. So in this way, you can gather a good quantity of resources and money by attempting to rob the rich, but if you push your luck too much, you will get nothing and you will have an arrested merry man. If you play an active merry man card to go to a hideout to rob the rich, you will still roll skill dice to attempt to rob the rich, but you'll get a specific benefit depending on which card you play. Note that each of the skills dice has three successes and three failures. The next action space is the construction yard, and recall that you must play a merry man card actively in order to access this space. This space allows you to build barricades and traps, and the cost for a barricade and cost for a trap depends on where you build that barricade or trap, and is shown in these tables here. Note also that whether you can build a barricade or a trap depends on the card you've played. This card here, for example, only has the barricade icon, and so you could only build a barricade with this card. This one would only allow you to build a trap. This one would allow you to build either a barricade or a trap. And then this one would let you build a trap at a one resource discount. So the cards that you hang on to in order to do these building actions will be important to your gameplay. In order to build a barricade, choose the road you want to barricade and pay the cost of that barricade. In the North Road's case, three wood and a coin. Any resources are returned to the supply and any pennies can be paid onto any one of the penny stacks on the board of your choice, not just the one corresponding to the road you've just built on. Then take the leftmost barricade from your player board and place it in the furthest away available barricade space from the castle. And note that each road has one printed barricade, in this case it's just a felled tree, already on the board. You'll place it in front of that one. To build a trap, find the cost of a trap in the location that you're attempting to build, pay all of those resources back to the supply. In the case of traps, there is no penny cost. And then take the leftmost available trap from your player board and place it in the first available hideout slot that does not contain a guard. It can go with another merry man. If the location is full of guards, you cannot build a trap there. As you place traps or barricades on the board through the game, you will start to reveal income, which you gain at the start of each merry men phase. The final income on each track allows you to unlock your fourth merry men space. Note also that as your traps or barricades are removed from the board, they do not recover these income spaces, but are simply placed next to your hero. The final Merry Men space is to send an envoy to the Crusades to tell King Richard of your progress. To do this, you must play a Merry Men card that has the Crusades icon, and then spend two weapons dice, two pennies, and two resources. The pennies that you spend can be placed on any one of the road stacks on the main board. Then, Place your Merry Men Meeple into this location. This Meeple will never return to you during the game. It will remain there until the game is over. Note also that some of the Merry Men cards will give you a discount on the cost, and that when you're paying resources, this specifically means wood, iron, or tools. Distraction tokens do not count as a resource for this purpose. Envoys take no further action at that point in time, but any envoys that you've sent will earn you victory points at the end of the game, as well as unlock some endgame objectives. At the start of the game, each player will be dealt three King Richard cards, and at the end of the game, you can activate one of these for each envoy that you have sent to the Crusades. The player's barricades, traps, and envoys will be worth a certain number of victory points at the end of the game, depending on how far the player has moved his or her marker up the reputation track during hero phases of the game. After the Merry Men phase is over, play proceeds to the hero phase, and to start the hero phase, players will be drafting weapon dice. 
In the game, there will be one die per colour per player. But players can gain these weapon dice during the Merry Men phase, so they may not all be there when the Hero phase begins. Players do need these dice to perform many of their hero's actions, which is why players will be drafting at least two. Starting with the player with the first player token, each player drafts one die from all of those available on the table. Then, after all players have drafted one, in reverse order, starting from the last player, players draw a second. After all players have drafted two dice, this phase is over. Note that players cannot hold more than four weapon dice at any given time, and if a player already has four, he or she no longer is part of the draft. After drafting dice, the player with the first player token takes his or her hero turn and that involves drawing and resolving one villain card, and then taking two actions with his or her hero meeple. We'll now go through all of the different icons that can be shown on the villain card and explain how to resolve these. The first type of action is to place a guard, shown by the guard's helmet, and one of the six gathering site locations. When this icon comes out, take a new guard and place it in the highest available hideout at the matching location that doesn't already have a guard. If there is a player's Merry Man Meeple there, that Merry Man is arrested. Leave the Meeple there for the moment, it won't go to prison until the end of the round, but the player must pay a fine in advance. And this is any one of his or her possessions, so a resource, a distraction token or a penny, which is placed next to the guard who has confiscated it. If the player has nothing that can be paid as a fine, then the meeple goes straight to the level 1 of the prison. If the guard is to be added to a hideout which has a trap in it, then the guard is trapped. Return the trap to the player who owns it and give the player that guard. That player can ransom that guard off later in the game for additional resources or victory points. If a guard is to be added to a location where all four of the hideouts are full, then instead place the guard over on the village guard's track. If this track ever fills up with six guards, the game is over and the players lose immediately. The second direction you might see is to move the sheriff to a specific location, and that's indicated by this star. Take the Sheriff of Nottingham Meeple and move it to the matching location. Then place two guards in hideouts around that area following the same rules as before. Guards can arrest any merry men who are in those hideouts just as before, but any merry men who are in the main area do not interact with the sheriff. The chest plate icon represents Guy of Gisborne, and Guy of Gisborne will go to one of the four roads. When this happens, place Guy of Gisborne on the road, and then remove the closest barricade to the castle returning it to the lair of the player who placed it there. If, after removing the barricade, there is a carriage which has no barricades in front of it, that carriage advances straight into the castle, and we'll explain what happens when a carriage goes into the castle slightly later in the video. The next type of icon is the crown, and this represents moving Prince John. Move Prince John to the space on the road that matches the card and then remove a number of pennies from that road stack equal to the number of barricades on the road. And this includes the pre-printed barricade at the head of every road. So in this case, you would remove two pennies. The final type of indication on any given card will be to activate a specific road. In order to activate a road, advance all carriages on that road past the next barricade in front of them like so, remembering that you have a printed barricade at the head of each row. If a carriage has gone past the final barricade, move it into the castle. Then, stand it upright and place it on the next space in the carriage lot. This will be filled up from top to bottom, left to right. And the number of columns in use depends on the number of players in the game. Then, Look at the number of pennies that's covered by that carriage and remove that many pennies from that road stack, returning it to the supply. Then, to finish the road activation action, 
draw a new carriage at random from the carriage bag, doesn't matter what color, and place it at the head of that road. Note that you will do this on every road activation, not just ones where a carriage enters the castle. There will be a separate effect when this fills up completely, but I'll go through what that is later in the video. There is one other type of villain card shown with a white border, and this is called the Golden Arrow card. With the Golden Arrow card, you move the Sheriff to the Archery Tournament and place one penny on the first part of the Archery Tournament, which makes this worth more money than it would normally be worth. These cards are optional for use in all player counts except for five players. They should always be used in the five player game. If you use it in a game of a lower player count, it will make the game a little bit easier, as this is the least damaging villain card for the players to draw. Next, we'll talk about the hero actions that can be taken. This is where you'll be placing your hero meeple out onto the board in order to take two actions on your turn. There are 14 different action spaces on the board where a hero can be placed. And these are any of the locations showing Robin Hood's hat in the markings next to the space. Six of the 14 locations are the gathering sites where your merry men could go. But your heroes will only go into the main areas, not into the hideouts. Four of the 14 locations are the four roads in the game. The other four are the prison, the archery, the weapons storage, and the village. As for the Merry Men action spaces, each location has an icon which identifies it on cards and other parts of the board. At the start of your hero turn, after you've resolved your villain card, your hero meeple will be on your player board. Then you take two moves with it, moving it out to a location, performing actions at that location, and then moving it to another location. After you've performed the action there, your hero meeple will stay there until the end of the round and then return to your board after the round is finished. Heroes can freely occupy spaces with other heroes. However, if a hero wishes to go to a location where there is a villain currently stationed, the player must spend one distraction token, the bottle of wine, in order to get around that villain. If the player cannot pay, he or she cannot move his or her meeple there. Because a player's hero meeple stays out on the board until the end of the round, the player is at risk of having another villain come and land on the same space. If this happens, once again the player must pay a distraction token in order to get around that villain, even though he or she is not currently performing an action. If you do not have a distraction token to pay in this circumstance, you will lose your special ability until the end of your next hero turn. Each player will have a hero card showing a special ability, so when this happens the player must flip that card over and cannot flip it back until the end of the next hero turn. The first type of action that you can take with your hero is to go to a road and ambush the carriages there. In order to ambush a carriage, you must have at least two dice matching the color of the carriage you're choosing to ambush. Then roll the dice that you've elected and although it is a minimum of two, you can roll more to improve your odds of success. And then as long as you roll at least one success, the weapon being a success and the shield being a failure, you have successfully ambushed that carriage. Note that these dice have four successes and two failures. When ambushing carriages, if you roll failures, you can spend a distraction token in order to re-roll a die and may continue doing this as long as you have distraction tokens. If you are successful, go through the following steps. Raise your marker one step up the reputation track. Then return any dice that you used in the ambush. This means that although you can increase your odds by rolling more dice at once, you will spend more dice at once and therefore have fewer dice for other actions. Then take the carriage that you've robbed and place it flat, not standing up, onto one of the spaces of this track. 
claiming the benefits shown in this box on the right hand side. That means you could place in the bottom row to cover up a three coins, preventing a carriage from taking three coins when it gets into the castle, but getting a smaller reward yourself. Or you could go to the top row claiming a greater benefit for yourself, but hurting the general team by leaving these three coin spots still open for carriages. Remember that this icon refers to one of the three building resources, not a distraction token. Then, any player who has a barricade on the road that was just robbed scores two points for each barricade on that road. Finally, if you still have enough dice to ambush another carriage on that same road, you can do that before moving away to perform another action. If your attempt to rob the carriage was unsuccessful, then you get no benefits, and you're not allowed to keep attempting to rob carriages in the same location. However, you do get to keep the dice rather than returning them as you would have if you were successful. At some point during the game, the carriage lot may become completely filled. And remember that the number of columns you use depends on the number of players in the game. This can fill when you rob a carriage, or it can fill when a road is activated and a carriage makes its way into the castle. When this happens, you must resolve a tax uprising. To do this, count up the number of carriages that you've robbed. These are the ones which are laid flat, so in this case it's seven and then perform that many road activations following the same rules that we went through before when drawing villain cards. When choosing which roads to activate, start with the one which has the most pennies and proceed down to the one with the fewest. In the event of a tie, most barricades and if still tied, fewest carriages. You must activate all four roads at least once when doing this before proceeding on to the fifth. Remove all of these carriages from the lot prior to doing these activations so that any carriages which get into the castle during this will start filling up this track and removing pennies once again. This incentivizes building barricades during the game. If the players spend all their time robbing carriages rather than building barricades, then they'll fill this up very quickly and the tax uprising will hurt quite a lot. But if players build a lot of barricades, they'll simply keep the carriages out, or they'll be better able to weather the storm when the tax uprising happens. The second type of action space available to the heroes is to go to a gathering site to fight guards. In order to fight the guards, the player must first choose which guard is to be fought, and then roll at least one die matching these icons on that clearing. So in here, it would be orange or pink dice. The player chooses the number of dice that he or she wishes to roll, and then rolls, attempting to get a single success to defeat a guard. As was the case for robbing carriages, a player may spend a distraction token to re-roll an unsuccessful die, and before rolling dice, may choose to roll more than the minimum amount in order to increase the chances of success. If you roll the weapon side of at least one of the dice rolled, then your attack has been successful, and go through the following steps. Move one step up the reputation track. Return any dice that were used in the battle. So once again, using more than the minimum number of dice improves your chances of success, but depletes your stock of dice more quickly. And then remove the guard from the board. In this case, the guard goes back to the main supply. It does not join your collection of trapped guards. Then if the guard that you remove was arresting a merry man, whether it's your own or someone else's, you get to take the fine which had been placed next to that merry man into your possession. Then the merry man is returned to the supply of the player who owns it. And if it is another player's merry man, you gain one victory point. If it's your own, you do not get this benefit. Finally, if you still have dice matching the location you're in, and there are still guards to fight, you can engage in another fight with a different guard. If you remove the final guard from a location, then you get to take the resource or bonus from that location as if you had played a passive merry man there. In the case of the town square, this means taking one loot token straight from the bag, 
without having to go through the skill check to rob it from the rich. If your roll was unsuccessful, keep any dice that you used in the battle, but you cannot fight further guards in that location. The next action that a hero can take is to try to break prisoners out of the prison. In order to do this, the hero spends distraction tokens, each of which will be worth two skill dice for a breakout attempt. The player may spend a maximum of three distraction tokens for a maximum of six dice. So in this case, the player spent two distraction tokens for four dice and rolls them, and can then use any successes which were rolled to break prisoners out of the prison. A prisoner on level one is worth one success, a prisoner on level two requires two, and a prisoner on level three requires three. So with this roll, the player could break out both level one prisoners or one level two prisoner. Unlike with weapon dice, distraction tokens cannot be spent to re-roll failures on skill dice. After choosing which prisoners to break out, the player then gains rewards from the sheriff's stash equal to the number of rewards shown here, or equal to the level of the prisoner. So by freeing these two prisoners, the player could take any two items from this stash. Then, for each prisoner released which is not of that same player's colour, the player gains a number of victory points equal to one more than the level of that prisoner. So, releasing this blue prisoner would be worth two victory points for red, but releasing his or her own prisoner is worth no further victory points. The 12th location a player can send his or her hero to is the archery grounds, and here the player can roll skill dice in order to earn money. At the first tournament, the player will roll three dice, attempting to score at least one success. If successful, the player takes one penny from the supply, as well as any pennies which have been placed in this location from Golden Arrow villain cards. Then the player moves to the next level, where he or she can roll three dice attempting to earn two successes for one coin, and if successful there, three successes off three dice for two coins. The player keeps progressing until he or she has won all tournaments or lost any one of them. Unlike the town square, where you are continuing to push your luck and risking going to prison and losing all the loot for an unsuccessful roll, at the archery grounds, there is no negative consequence to failing a skill roll, and you will always keep any loot that you've gained in previous levels. Additionally, you cannot spend distraction tokens to re-roll skill dice at the archery grounds. The 13th location that a player can send his or her hero is the weapon storage, and when there, the player may take as many actions as he or she wishes from this menu of actions. When here a player can spend wood or iron to gain specific types of weapons dice from the main supply, assuming those dice are still there. Or the player can freely exchange weapons dice for other weapons dice, again, that are currently in the supply. The player must respect the limit of having no more than four weapons dice at any time. The final available hero action is to go to the village and give money back to the poor. To do this, the player may take as much money from his or her possessions as desired, return it to the supply, not to the tracks of pennies on the board, and then for every two pennies returned, remove one guard from the guard track, returning them to the supply, and gain two victory points for each guard. This is the only way to get guards off the guards track if players are close to losing on this condition. Note also that each player has a character card which includes a special action or effect which his or her hero may take during the hero phase. And you can check out exactly what all of these mean in page 25 of the rulebook. After the hero phase is over, there is an end of round phase before proceeding to the next round. The first step of this is that any players who have captured guards in their traps have the opportunity to ransom them back to the prince. On the board you will find a ransom tile and this tells you what you can get for your ransom in this round. And there are several tiles and there will be a new one in each round. The player may activate each half of the ransom tile a maximum of once 
And so in this case, the player could ransom these two guards back for seven victory points, or could ransom one of them for two pennies, but could not ransom both for four pennies. Note that among the tiles, you will find tiles that ransom one guard for three points and three guards for 12 points. And so you may want to hang on to the guards until you get a higher value tile, but you may miss out on that if you wait too long. Then, at the end of each round except for the final round, advance all prisoners one space deeper into the prison. Any prisoners who are already on level 3 are hanged, never to come back. Then, if there are any merry men who were arrested in this round, and their guards were not later defeated by a hero during hero phase, those merry men are sent to the first level of the prison, and the fines that their players paid are moved into the sheriff's stash. Then, players retrieve their hero meeples, and any merry men meeples other than those who are at the crusades or in the prison. After retrieving merry men, fill them into these hideout spaces and fill up any empty spaces from your training grounds, as long as you have merry men there to fill with. If you have one or fewer merry men on your entire board, you must immediately free one merry man from prison and lose five victory points. Then discard any active merry men cards and you may optionally discard any of your closed merry men cards from your hand. Then draw back up to four cards for the next round. Then return the villains back to the castle. Discard the ransom tile and draw a new one at random from the stack. Advance the round marker and hand the first player token to the next player clockwise. After the final round is finished, if the villains haven't defeated the players, add up your final scores by taking the following steps and adding them to any points gained during the game. Firstly, look at the number of barricades, traps, and envoys that you have built or sent during the game. These will score a number of points based on the level you've reached on the reputation track. So in this case here, two barricades worth seven points, two traps worth six, and two envoys worth five. This would be added to the player's score. Then, for each envoy that a player has sent, he or she may activate one of the King Richard's task cards. Go through each of them and work out which ones are worth the most points based on how the board is currently set up, and then add those points, one per envoy, to your score. Next, count up the scores for the passive Merry Men pile that you've accumulated, and remember this can be no more than six cards. First, add victory points that are shown down here in the corner. So in this case, it's five victory points. Then take the cards and sort them out into sets of matching Merry Men. Sets of one are worth no extra points. Sets of two are worth three points. Sets of three are worth six. Four is worth 10 and five is worth 15. So add these points to your score. Then gain one point for any guards that you've captured but haven't been able to ransom and one point for every three total possessions left in this box. So in this case, two points for six possessions. Also gain five victory points if you've reached the top step on the reputation track. Finally, players lose victory points for any of their merry men still in the prison, losing one point for a level one, two points if on level two, three for level three, and four points for any hanged merry men. The player with the highest score wins, and in the event of a tie, Whoever is furthest up the reputation track wins, and if still tied, whoever has the most combined barricades, traps, and envoys breaks the tie. If still tied, victory is shared. The game of Robin Hood also comes with three additional modules which can be integrated into the semi-cooperative game. The first of those, the Golden Arrow module, we've already spoken about. These cards are shuffled in with the rest of the villain cards and make the player's life a little bit easier, as this is a fairly gentle villain card to draw. This must be used in the five player game, but is optional at all other player counts. The next module is the Friar Tuck module. To set up for the Friar Tuck module, 
place the Friar Tuck Meeple in the church, and then give each player three Friar Tuck cards. The game comes with a set of 15, but there are five copies of each of the three different cards, so make sure each player has one of each. The Friar Tuck cards are placed into the player's passive pile, but they do not count towards the player's limit of six cards in that pile. On a player's turn during the Merry Men phase, instead of playing a Merry Men card to play a Meeple, the player may play a Friar Tuck card, moving it from the passive side to the active side, from where it will be discarded at the end of the round, to move the single Friar Tuck Meeple to a matching location on that card. This counts as if the player had taken an active Merry Man move, and therefore Friar Tuck will end up in a hideout if the player moves to one of these gathering sites. The player then takes the benefits shown on that card. This will give the player an extra action for this round, because he or she will still be allowed to place all Merry Men, but players can play only one Friar Tuck card per round. At the end of the hero phase, if Friar Tuck has not been arrested by the guards, he will move back to the church. Friar Tuck can be arrested and sent to prison just like any merry man in the game. The differences are that Friar Tuck does not pay a fine to the sheriff's stash when he is arrested, and a player who releases Friar Tuck, either from prison or from a guard out in the field, will gain one extra victory point. So in this case here, releasing Friar Tuck from level 1 would be worth 3 points instead of the normal 2. At the end of the game, any unspent Friar Tuck cards still in the player's passive pile are scored exactly as Merry Men cards. So points on the cards and points for the set that's remaining. However, playing with the Friar Tuck module introduces another loss condition for the players. If Friar Tuck is still in prison at the end of the game, the players lose, and if Friar Tuck is ever hanged, the game ends and the players lose immediately. The game's other module is the Spies module, and to set up for this, simply shuffle the Spies deck and put it near the board. During the game, any time one of your Merry Men is arrested, and being arrested means being accosted by a guard out in the field, you don't have to go into the prison in order to be counted as arrested, draw the top Spies card and add it into your passive pile. This is worth negative victory points if it stays in your passive pile, and it fills up one of the six slots available in that pile. So it adds quite an additional penalty for having your Merry Men arrested. You will still need to pay a fine when you're arrested in this manner. However, on subsequent rounds, you'll be able to take these spies out of your passive pile and play them into your active pile in order to take the action on that card. In order to do this, there must be at least one guard in the location matching that card. Remove one of those guards of your choice and replace it with your merry man. Then take the action shown. In the case of these spies cards, you will have to pay money in order to get the resources at that location. So while you can get more resources at once, it is going to be a more expensive exercise than if you were to send a merry man there. The spy then gives the player further counterintelligence against Prince John. Take the villain deck, draw a number of cards from the top equal to the number of players, look at them, and then return them in the same order. You now know what villain cards will be coming up in the next hero phase. Thematically, this sequence counts as the sheriff implanting spies into your organisation, and then you successfully converting them to joining your cause. Finally, we'll take you through some of the rule changes that are involved in playing in the fully cooperative and solo modes of the game. The full details, including setup changes, are in this supplemental rulebook included with the game. We'll begin with the fully cooperative mode. When playing fully cooperatively, the reputation and score markers are not used. The game is played over four rounds, and the player's sole aim is to survive against the villain's win conditions. This means never running out of pennies on a stack, never filling up the guards track, and in an additional condition, ensuring that there are no prisoners left in the prison 
at the end of the game. Additionally, any hanged prisoners will automatically cause the players to lose the game. There are two different difficulties in which to set up the game, normal and hard, and those have different rules about how many guards and carriages are placed onto the board to start the game, and I'll leave you to read that in the rulebook. There are two main changes to gameplay. The ransom tiles are not used, and instead players may ransom guards in order to free prisoners during the ransom phase in the round. The number of guards required matches the number of guards on this level, so one guard for a level 1 prisoner, two for a level 2, and so on. The other is that while the King Richard cards are still used in the game, they are no longer used as endgame objectives. Instead, when a player sends a Merry Man to be an envoy in the Crusades, the team gets a King Richard card. Then, at any point later in the game, the players may spend that card, in order to ignore one of the effects on a villain card. Captive guards and King Richard cards are considered property of the whole team, not of an individual player, and so players may pull them and spend them at any point on any player's turn. Finally, we'll give you a quick introduction to the solo mode of the game. When playing in solo mode, you must use the green components, as this is the only color that has enough merry men for the game. Use the solo board overlay, which will give you five active merry men and five inactive merry men. You start with a hand of six merry men cards instead of four, and you will use all of the heroes in the game. You may or may not use King Richard cards depending on which scenario you're playing, and there are five given in the rule supplement. And instead of the basic villain cards, you will use the solo villain cards which will make more things happen on each card. At the start of the hero phase, instead of drafting only two weapons dice, you will draft four, and you can hold a maximum of six in the game. However, the basic setup for the game is the same as the two-player semi-cooperative setup, and so there will only be two copies of each color of die available for you to take. Then, Draw one of your solo villain cards and resolve all of its effects. And then in your hero action phase, you will move and take two actions with two of the five available heroes, going out onto the board and taking actions in both of those locations. At the end of your hero phase, you'll bring those heroes back, but those won't be available for use in the subsequent round. Put those ones off to the side, you will only have the other three to choose from. After the following round, you won't have those two to choose from, but you'll bring back the first couple that you used. The rulebook supplement comes with five different scenarios that you can try out in solo mode, such as playing a normal game and trying to earn 130 victory points, or starting with more carriages or guards on the board than the normal game and just trying to survive the time. That's how to play. Robin Hood and the Merry Men. We hope that you enjoyed the video and we hope that you enjoyed playing the game. We found through playing the game that there is quite a lot of little points to remember in a lot of the actions. So we put together a simple text cheat sheet which we use during the game. We've uploaded that to our website meepleuniversity.com and if you'd like to download that you can click on the link in the description to get there. And finally, if you'd like to hear more from us, please click the meeple in the corner to subscribe for us. Thank you.